fellowship in the word, to be instructed in the word, a place to take the sacraments together and to celebrate the Lord. Fellowship together and a common meal and systematic study of the word, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, that we may see the entire counsel of God, not excluding the difficult parts, not excluding the parts that require study and explanation, not excluding the parts that are politically unacceptable. Very few times, but every once in a while, we take a step aside from our current study, which is in Ephesians, because we are celebrating a very special occurrence. And while those who may not be closely aligned with the household of faith recognize it as a time for simply celebrating family, to those who have some understanding of the implications of the birth of Jesus, know that there is a figure, some feel is a historic figure, others kind of put him in the same category as other mythological figures from our culture. And then there are those who are truly acquainted with the story in such a way that it has permanently impacted their lives and understand that this isn't just a birth of a particular and celebrated human being. This was God come in the flesh, the product of prophecies given to the world hundreds of years before. And then through a series of circumstances that some who were involved in the fulfillment of those circumstances probably would not have chosen that at times brought hardship, at times seemed very improbable, at times seemed to take them from the direction that they truly would want to go on their own. That every single thing that happened, though it looked like chaos, was surely and definitely put into place by the hand of Almighty God himself so that things would be fulfilled when he said, how he said, and to have the effect that he intended. And he told us about it hundreds of years before, so there could be no mistake. One of the things that I've been amazed with in my academic career is the number of people who are so dead set in their belief that Christianity is simply a belief system generated by people and bolstered by fable. Nothing could be further from the truth. I, I've often said, I don't have the faith not to be a Christian because when you explore the empirical information that supports Christianity, it's almost impossible not to believe. And I don't see, say that because I'm here teaching. I say that because I remember the day when through the course of preparing for a class, it all dawned on me. I was doing a survey class. It just hit me like cold water pouring over someone I knew it was all true. And I knew it intellectually. I knew it in my heart. I had really come to grips with it. And what we're going to do this morning is a little bit different. We have, we've never done this before. But I have taken several areas that have to do with the issue of the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. And I've taken the scriptures, and I hope you brought your Bibles because I'm going to hand them out to you. 
And as each individual gets your scripture, I would recommend to you that you remember which one it is. We're going to ask you to look it up. And in order, we're going to ask you to read it. Three of the scriptures are from Old Testament books. The book of Isaiah has often been called the fifth gospel because it tells of the birth of a Messiah, one specifically anointed for the delivery of Israel and the entire world. And it describes his birth, issues of his life. It describes his death. Isaiah 53 gives a somewhat detailed account 800 years before the death of Jesus and describes even the fact of Roman soldiers gambling for his garments, of a Roman soldier giving him vinegar to drink, the common drink of Roman soldiers, the story of his bruised and bloody body after being beaten before he went to the cross. And this occurred before the Romans adopted crucifixion at all. It's because God is able to see the end before the beginning. So you ready to go? I'm going to ask you to adopt a scripture and let me know that you're going to take that scripture. The first is Isaiah 7.14. We'll take that. William? Thank you. The next is Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. We'll take that. <coughs> okay, Danny, you take that. The next is Micah 5, 2. I got it. Who's got it? Okay, Micah, Dan? Say it again, Micah 5, 2. Yeah, Micah 5, 2. <clears throat> the next is Luke 1, 26 through 45. Okay? The next is Matthew 1, 18 to 25. Josh? The next one is Luke 1, 57 through 66. Okay, Christina. The next is Luke 1, 67 through 80. Please. The next is Luke 2, 1 through 7. Okay, Casey. The next is Luke 2, 8 through 21. All right. The next is Luke 2, 22 through 38. Please. 2, 22, 22 through 38. Oh, I and the next is Luke 2, 1 through 12. That's Matthew. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Matthew. I'll take it. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I dropped my phone okay. right yes. Matthew 2, 1 through 12. Okay, there's a bunch of them that are Luke 2. I'm the first Luke 2. I think I was, I was right after Casey. Okay, the first Luke 2 is Luke 2, 1 through 7. That's what he had. And then Luke, and then Luke 2, 8 through 21. And then Luke 2, 22 through, 20 through 38. All right, I like this stuff. You guys can flip around and look at that. Now. I'll tell you what all this is connected to. For those who have been battered with the idea that Jesus was, there are those that suggest that Jesus was just a metaphor for a way of believing. The truth of the matter is, Jesus of Nazareth was a real life flesh and blood human being. And the events that surround his birth are verifiable for, from sources other than the Bible to include Roman records, to include government documents that were sequestered away at the library at Alexandria, Egypt, that were never in the custody of Christians, 
never in the custody of Jews, but under the seal of the Roman government. It's not just a story. It's reality. What we find in the scripture is more accurate than what we find in the popular media today. That wouldn't be hard to do. No, that wouldn't be very difficult. I guess that's not a very good analogy, is it? As a matter of fact, I, I read something that said that in a national poll, of course, polls are lousy too, but in a national poll, confidence in the veracity and truthfulness of the media in the general population is 6%. 6%. Just to bring that's on media too? I beg your pardon? And that's on media too? Yeah. All right. I'm just getting my one scripture together here. Okay, are we ready? First are the prophecies concerning the birth of Christ. All prophecies from Luke and from Micah were written in the 8th century BC. How do we know that? There are those that say that the prophecies in Isaiah are so accurate that they could not possibly have been written ahead of time, that they were actually written between the 1st and 2nd uh, century AD, and that they simply look back on events. The difficulty with that is that these scriptures were found in 1948 in the caves of Qumran, known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they were appropriately dated for the period at 8 BC. And they are exactly the same as you have in your Bible. We know that they were written before they happened. And that's not a matter of conjecture. How, how, long, how long before Christ? Uh, eight, eight, centuries. Eight, uh, eight centuries, between eight, seven and eight hundred years. So at any rate, Isaiah seven fourteen. <coughs> Who's got it? I do. <clears throat> Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign: Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall be called and God with us. That's the definition of Emmanuel. There are those that would say to us that Jesus was simply a good man with a social agenda. It is clear that from the 8th century BC that it was clearly stated that he would be God come in the flesh. Isaiah 9.6 for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with justice, or with judgment and with justice, from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. There are those that would try to tell us that Jesus could not possibly have been God come in the flesh because there is one God, even Jehovah, ignoring the existence of a trinity. Three beings, all of one substance, one purpose, and one mind. The scripture now tells us that a son would be born, God come in the flesh, he would be known as the Heavenly Father, he was God. Not just a good man, but he was fully God and he was fully man. Micah 5.2 But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old and everlasting. Take note that it says that the Messiah has to come from where? Bethlehem. He had to come from Bethlehem. There could be nothing else. Next, the next scriptures have to do with the birth of Jesus and its foretelling. Luke 1, 26 through 45.
Who's got it? Luke 1, 26 through 45. The Euphrates River Valley. Ephrata, it's the region around the Euphrates. Bethlehem, Ephrata? It's Ephrata. Ephrata. Oh, Ephrata. Ephrata. Well, okay. Um, but that's where Ephrata's name is from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know it wasn't this Ephrata, so I was not. You got it? Okay, go ahead. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel, the angel Gabriel, Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the, the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come to you on the will come to you, and on the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born to the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be fulfilled. And then the angel left. The purpose? No, that's fine. Okay. And then Matthew 1 18 through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was favorable to the law and yet did not want to expose it to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because this is because what is conceived in her is, is from the Holy Spirit, and she will give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save people from all he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his, as his wife. But did he? But he did not. Uh, uh, consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. You know, it's hard not to just jump in here and start preaching. <laughs> but, yeah. But at any rate. It, you know, some, some believe that Mary and Joseph never had a married life in that verse. Too. The scripture verse is right clear. That's, yeah. what, that's why we read this chapter by chapter, right. verse by verse when we study it. Yeah. Because the scripture makes those things clear. When you consider Mary... Mary was a young woman living in a country that was under siege. The effective tax rate for many people was 90%. They were, they were poor people, and we'll go over that in a little bit. Mary is approached by an angelic being who drops news on her that every Jewish girl hopes she would hear, that she would be the mother of the Messiah. Joseph, when confronted with that, if you think your life has trouble, Really, if you think your life has seen a lot of hard times, listen to this. Problems in your family? Listen to the problems in Jesus' family. Before he was born, he was under threat of an ex facto abortion. You say, well, what do you mean by that? 
If Joseph had a stepped up as a righteous Jew when he found out Mary was pregnant and he had gone to the synagogue to get out of the betrothal for a Jewish man and a Jewish girl. Men were usually in their 30s, girls usually 14 to 16, 17. The only way, it would, when you became betrothed, it could be when the girl was a child and you became part of her life from that time forward. Even sometimes providing money from your house, everything to care for that woman, that girl. And everybody knew, there was no question when she was growing up, that she was going to be that man's wife. So a betrothal was more than an engagement, but less than a marriage. And if you were betrothed, you had to get a formal divorce to walk away. And Joseph, to have been able to carry out the mandate to carry on his family line by marrying somebody else, would have to have taken Mary to the synagogue, announced that she was expecting before they were married, and the sentence for that was death. Now, if you've ever wondered if the trouble you're having could possibly be in the will of God, ask Jesus. He spent nine months with Joseph enjoying the confidence of God that he would do the right thing and then believe God against all odds. And Mary's life hanged in the balance. You don't hear that at the average Christmas program, do you? All right. The scripture tells us that before the Messiah would come, there would be one that would come in, this, in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Luke 1, 57 through 66, the birth of John the Baptist. Now Elizabeth full time came for her to be delivered. And she brought forth a son. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. So it was on the eighth day that they, became, they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. His mother answered and said, No, he shall be called John. But they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who is called by this name. So they made signs for his, to his father that would have, what he would have been called, what he would have him called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, saying, His name is John. So they all marveled. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loose, and he spoke, praising God. Then fear came on all who dwelt around them, and those sayings were discussed throughout the hill of the country of Judea. And all those who heard them kept them in their hearts, saying, What kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. So John was born in peculiar circumstances to elderly parents. Now you might ask, so what was the prophecy that brought this about? Luke 1, 67 through 80. And his father, Zacharias, filled with the Holy Spirit, prophesying, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy and promise of our, to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people, and for in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give us a, to give light to those who sit in darkness, and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day 
of his public appearance to Israel. So exactly the way it was prophesied, John was born to prepare the way of the Messiah, knowing that he was coming. John and Jesus were cousins. Angels appear to the shepherds. Luke 2, 8 through 21. And there were in the Did I skip one? Yeah. Whoops. Excuse okay. me. I skipped one. That's what I... Sorry. Okay. <laughs> it, and it was a small matter, the birth of Jesus. <laughs> Luke 2, 1 through 7. Christ is born of Mary. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was, with, so it was that while they were there, in the, day, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now angels appear. Luke 2, 8 through 21. And there in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of God, our Lord, shone around about them and they were sore afraid and the angel said unto them fear not for behold I bring good tidings of great joy <coughs> for which shall be up to all people for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord and this shall be a sign unto you ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel uh, with multitudes of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on peace on earth, good will toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them unto heaven, the angels said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem, see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they made, came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad, saying which was told unto them concerning this child. And all they heard with wonder wondered at those things which were told by the shepherds. But Mary kept all things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen was told unto them. Do I have one more? Yeah. One more? Okay. And when eight days of were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which is so named of the angel which he was conceived in the womb. Okay, Luke, tw Luke 2, 22 through 38, the presentation of Jesus. Me, right? Yeah. Now when the days of the purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of uh, turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and, his, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. 
and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that, that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Jesus, the Lord Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to <coughs> do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. More? That's good. And the next one, I just had to throw in here because I have to make a comment. Matthew 2, 1 through 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes, of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the pro prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. When Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared, uh, and he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you, find, when you have found him, bring me word, that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that had, they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw, a child with, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worship, worshipped him. Do you notice a few peculiar words in it? They followed the star to the place where he was, not was born. Number two, when they came into the house, not manger. Why? Because the wise men didn't show up until two to three years after Jesus was born. So every nativity scene you've ever gotten has had three usurpers next to the sheep. They weren't there. But anyway, I just had to bring that up. Turn with me, if you would, please, to Luke, the second chapter. <clears throat> you know, we have a tendency sometimes to feel that if we're living in times of turmoil and trouble, that somehow God has gone on vacation. When we're having personal turmoil and trouble, and when the alligators are really close to the boat, when we're in the spot where something has to happen because we can't see any way out, when we have done everything we could do and then finally take the last resort and we pray, which is what we should have done first, it's easy for the enemy of our soul to hammer away at the idea that somehow God has taken us out to the middle of a problem situation and walked away. Nothing could be further from the truth. Luke, the second chapter, beginning in the first verse. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be, if you have a King James, it says taxed. Mm -hmm. If you have other texts, it says be registered. And it means to be registered to tax. There's an entire set of events that have gone on before this for some 30 years, 40 years, that are very significant. Rome was in the midst of a transition. Originally founded as a republic to be controlled by a popularly elected senate. Rome had made, a had made a transition through political intrigue, through wars, 
through terrible circumstances where the control of its government had fallen to a series of generals. And these generals ruled ruthlessly and there was consistent, consistent war on all sides. And the people were weary. Finally, an adopted son of Julius Caesar, well not son, grandson actually, a fellow by the name of Gaius Octavius, paired together with one other general, you may have heard of him, called Mark Antony, and they together essentially put down the rebellions and they whipped all the enemies of Rome. Octavius was 